throwback program and a throwback uh, uh, music. And I love that music, praise God. Don't let that die. Throwback fashion. So let me tell you about my fashion. Let me tell you where, what happened to your, your pastor. <laughs> I was talking to Brian, I believe it was. He went on his phone. He's always pull up stuff and found a little vintage shop over on Gallatin Road. It uh, uh, used to be a fire station, so I went over there. They didn't have anything. They had a lot of the things that the hippies wore, you know, but that's, I didn't dress like that in the 70s. This is how I dressed in the 70s. And so they suggested that I go to this other store, which was down there by East High School. I walked in there, and they had two racks of suits, you know, little circular things. I went all around and didn't see anything. And then I saw this one, and it was lime green, a, a lime green plaid. And I put the coat on, it was a little big. I said, I, know, I might be able to work with this. So I asked the lady if I could try the trousers on. I took them back, and I said, then I said, you know, you know, I like to coordinate stuff. I said, I ain't got nothing I can put with this. This says ain't going to work. And I think Rachel called me. You were talking, we were talking on the phone. I took that suit back out there, and I continued to look on the rack, and I came across this one. <laughs> and while I'm talking to you, I pull it out. I said, it fits. <laughs> now, you have to understand, a person like me, I have... All of my clothes are tailored because they don't make clothes to fit me. They're making them now to fit me. <laughs> but, but everything had to be altered back in the day. I said, this coat looked like it was made for me. I put the vest on and the, 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 the pants hadn't ever been here. It was brand new. No one has ever worn it. Still had the tags on, $130 tag on it. And then I looked on the inside it says exclusive for Kastner not. <laughs> Who knows about Kastner not? See what I'm talking about? Praise God. 100% polyester, and that's why I'm burning up up here. <laughs> and, it was, you know, three-piece suits was, was, was in, and bell bottoms. Look at that. They got bell bottoms and everything. So... I said, thank you, God. Hallelujah. Then we had to find some hair, and I think my grandson thinks I've grown hair. They had to explain to him that this was a, a wig. And um, my granddaughter, you know, she approached me last week, or maybe about two weeks ago, and she said, Papa, I think I want you to dye your hair again. Then I, I said, okay. She's just trying to see how she can you know, push me around, because I am, I ain't, I will, I won't, you know, back and forth, back and forth. She's just jerking me around now. So this is not dye, Olivia. This is eyebrow pencil. And I, I went to wipe my face. <laughs> Wiped it off on my handkerchief, praise God. So we're going to have to come out this hair, praise God, hallelujah. So when I decided that, uh, I said, well, maybe I will do a throwback message, a sermon that I preached back in the 70s. And so as I was going through the stuff, I said, well, let me bring this, because this coffee table, uh, it's not a coffee table, it's a telephone table. We would stack the uh, telephone books, and the mother had a real large Bible to give it some height. And I would take my messages, and you're right, Elder Harold, back in the day, I would just take a piece of copy paper, fold it in half, and had four sheets these were my sermons. It's over 600 sermons in this box. Praise God. And so I got those rolled up. Then down through here, I'll just, it's 2,080 some sermons right here. From 1978 to 2018. Why are y'all applauding for that? Okay, all right. Now, what I uh, did, I didn't start uh, dating them until around 1980. So all the ones that don't have dates on them, I know they were in 78 and 79. So the one that I'm, I'm uh, bringing back, I know it was in the late 70s. I'm just not sure what Sunday when it was preached because it's not dated, amen? But it's entitled, I Can't Hear You. Some of you might remember that one, praise God. I can't hear you. Praise the Lord. Several significant things happened in 1978. 
And these things have made a lasting impact on uh, our society as a whole, praise God. One of the first things is that the first test tube baby was born in 1978. And then uh, the cellular mobile phone was introduced uh, in Illinois. I'm not certain what city, probably Chicago, but it said Illinois in 1978. Sweden was the first country to recognize the effect of aerosol sprays on the ozone layer. So they outlawed aerosols, you know, things of that nature. Then uh, most of you can remember the occult leader Jim Jones and how he led his congregation of 900 people, 900 members into committing suicide. Uh, Jimmy Carter was president and uh, he uh, holds the recognition for pulling the Camp David Accord together. And this is what Egypt and uh, Israel uh, were uh, signing an agreement so that they would, could exist in uh, 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 a close environment with a spirit of peace. And I think he got a peace prize for that. Then, I'm going to ask you some questions now. In 1978, what was the average cost of a house? Just shout it out if you think you know. 35, 38, $54,800. I think of where we started this service, uh, Elder Waters, $10,000 for that house, praise God. Probably took him 50 years to pay it all. What was the average income? $17,000. Now, if you have a family of four and you make less than $34,000, they say you're in poverty. $17,000. I remember going to my department chairman. I said, I need a raise. I got a family and two kids. And I think I was making $11,000 a year or something like that. She said, when I became department chairman, I was only making $14,000 a year. I said, wow. <laughs> so I say that because a gallon of gas was only $0.63. Cents, and you could <laughs> buy a dozen of eggs <laughs> for $0.48. Cents. And your average monthly rent was only $260. Remember our apartment? Uh, the rent was $250. And they were going up on the rent, and I went and testified and told them what we were doing, and they lowered my rent $5. So about everybody else's rent went up, ours came down just because of a testimony. But something else happened in August. August the 8th, 1978. And you have to hear all these eights because that number eight is very significant to Born Again Church. It was the eighth day of the eighth month. Born Again Church and Christian Outreach Ministry was established with eight people at 822 North 6th Street. Uh, and there are more eights, and we won't, we'll get into that later. 858 is our address out here. We didn't ask for it. That's what they gave us. Praise God. The number eight is very significant in, in the Bible. It actually means new beginnings. Thus, born again. That's a new beginning. Amen? There are eight steps in the creation uh, of our universe or this world. And every time God numbered another step, something existed that didn't exist before. And he began each one of them with uh, the statement, and God said. Read them. It's in Genesis, that's, uh, third through the 26th verses, first chapter. And God said, let there be light. Bam. It's eight of those. So each one indicated a new beginning of something. Then in John, um, the 20th chapter, the 26th verse, on the eighth day after the resurrection of Jesus, um, uh, yes, that's right. He appeared to his disciples because he was instituting a what? A new covenant. No, new beginnings, new beginnings. So we are caught up in the spirit of what? Introducing something new and making certain that people understand what the vision and the mission of Born Again Church is about. In Philippians 4 and 8, uh, it lists eight things God commands us to do uh, as believers if we want to, per to perfect uh, our new life. And those things are uh, whatever, whatsoever is true or just or honest or lovely or pure or good report, virtuous, praise. He says, what? Well, think on those things. Now, if we would just do that, because I know what we think on, but it's not things that are praiseworthy. You know, we're so gossip and bad news oriented, and we like to spread the wrong thing. 
We don't know what to cast down. And then says, well, let's see what God is saying, and then let's project that into the earth. And if you do, you can generate a new spirit in the atmosphere, and that will bring people to a place of uh, a blessing. Amen? Amen? So with that in mind, I believe it is clear that our mission as a church is verified and is substantiated in the heart and the will of God. We are commissioned by God to present the option of new beginnings through Jesus Christ. Now, this option that we're offering is actually called salvation or redemption or being born again or just getting saved. Amen? So whenever we give someone that opportunity, they have the opportunity to what? To start over. They can get a new beginning. You have to have Christ in your life. You got to receive him in order to experience that. But in our effort to preach this option, it's also increasingly clear that people are simply hard of hearing. And I don't care how good the message is or how good it is for you. Something prevents us from comprehending or receiving or listening or actually hearing what God is trying to do for us. And we, our attentions are drawn to other things as opposed. So in scripture, you find God giving us boldness or tenacity to do some things that would impress upon those that we're trying to present this option to. And we have to break through the madness and all of the clutter and the noise and make certain that I, what we're saying has clarity. Yeah. So it can pierce Amen. the heart of the individual. Because the word of God is established to do just that. It knows how to divide. It knows how it can go where it needs to go. But we have to be in the position to present that. So people are hard of hearing. So with that, I found this sermon. And this sermon is called, I Can't Hear You, Praise God. And I can't read this either. So <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have glasses on in 78, praise God, hallelujah. But some of those, I'm um, looking at Daniel. I don't know, you could have been sitting there when I ministered this some years ago. Um, I don't understand... Um, I don't know uh, about you, but there was something, uh, maybe you can identify with this, something absolutely captivating about playing outside at the dusk of the day, moving into night. You all remember those summer days when you loved to be outside? And it was especially fun because people, would, the kids who lived in the neighborhood, they would come to your house, but we always had games that we played outdoors. Our imaginations were off the hook. We were doing some of everything, amen? So that's what I enjoyed. Daylight was fading. There was always this uncertain mystery surrounding the approaching darkness because it's getting dark. But even though uh, if you were like me, you, could have been, you were afraid of the dark, but there was something else going on in this scenario that get, uh, I would say helped to ease my spirit. And that was the oversight of my parents. Because even though we could be outside playing, mom sitting on the front porch in the rocker, just rocking. And I don't care what you're doing, you can just look up there, you know, everything's all right. Let's get pitch black over here, pitch black over here, street lights on. And we were running, but you kind of felt safe. And not only did you feel safe because you had that oversight, you felt safe because they had also given you boundaries. Don't go in the street. Stay in the yard. They wanted to make certain they could see or at least hear your activity. So now you had the freedom to roam and to do and do all of that, but you were still covered. It's something about being covered, especially if you're living in darkness. Amen? So um, we felt safe. Then it came down to the games that we would play. And one of them was called hide and go seek or hide and seek. Last night, my grandchildren uh, are at the house. They love this game. Last night, night before, 24 robbers at my door. I got up, let them in, hit them across the head with a rolling pin. I don't know who came up with these lyrics. <laughs> Praise God. And then you go through the rules of the game, and you, you say out loud, uh, and each one of these games that I'm going to discuss has a, has a designated it. You were it. 
And if you were hit, you were the one that had to kind of what uh, control how the game was going. So uh, then you would say stuff, something like, all around my base is out. So you couldn't hide around the base. If you're standing on a tree, that was the base, all right? Or whatever you designated. And you go through all those rules, and then you would count. And when you get through the end of that uh, uh, cadence, or whatever it is that you counted to, then you would say, ready or not, here I come. So by that time, everybody else was supposed to be hidden. And you have to, what, find them. And so you start running. Now, if you come up on someone's body, and if they ran, you had to beat them to the base. If you touched the base before they did, they were out. And then you do this, you know, and you couldn't beat all of them running. But whoever, praise God, didn't get to the base in time, they were the next designated it, okay? So those games are fun, right? And, and I like playing them with little children because they think they have hidden. <laughs> and you see stuff and the bottom is sticking out or the feet are showing or... You know, they just know they're in a dark place, praise God. But we became pretty good at it. And it's better to play games like that in the dark because, you know, the dark helps to hide you as well, all right? So that was one. Now, this game has been around for generations because one of the earliest uh, designations that we could find, it was being played in 1881. Uh, so someone referenced it then, so it's probably older than that. Then there's the other game that we played. It was called One, Two, Three, Red Light. Or if you look it up online, it's just called red light, green light. And the designation of this game, you had an it, and the, he, the it was the red light or the green light. And all the other kids were at the other end of the sidewalk, way down there. And then you were supposed to turn around, and you would count. And you would say, one, two, three, red light. And when you would turn around, they didn't know when you were going to say red light. Red light means what? To stop, right? As long as you're on green, these people back here, it was the object of the game was for them to be the first one to touch you. And so when you turn around, they start running. And then you would do it in one, two, three, red light, or you do one, two, three, red light, or, you know. But whoever you caught moving had to go all the way back to the beginning. So it's, it was something to make certain, so well, I'm going to, and some people play safe, and they wouldn't rush, and some people just take a chance and just bolt, and they get caught every time. And some just going to take two steps and just wait for you to say red light, because they ain't going to get caught in their mess. They know how to play the game. Mom's going to look at some point, but when she does, I'm reading my Bible. When she does turn around, I, I'm referencing scripture, you know, or I'm in prayer. And as soon as she turns, y'all know what I'm talking about. We play these games, all right? So uh, then we played Blind Man's Bluff. Did you all, you all remember that one? Yeah. Blind man, blind man, you can't see. Turn around, what, three times, try to catch me. It's another um, a game where you're trying to... Uh, uh, grab hold or touch somebody who is taunting you while you're blindfolded. And when they turn you around, you don't know what position you're in. You could have been facing the door, but when they get through, you could be facing the wall, facing the window, or people around. Now, you are fumbling in the dark trying to find these people, right? And whoever you touch, they, get, uh, they become the it. This game actually originated during the Tudor period. That's from 1485 to 1603. So some of these games we've been playing an awful long time. Amen? Then we come to this game called, I don't know if you all remember this one, Grandma Gray. Yes. Yes. Grandma Gray. And the object of Grandma Gray was that uh, the, she had a bunch of kids, praise God, and they, she wanted to keep them clean. And so she wouldn't give them permission to go outside because she knew they would get their clothes dirty. So she's... The, the uh, lyrics or, some, or the lines were, Grandma, Grandma, Gray, can we go outdoors and play, door, doors and play? And she would say, no. Be and they said, why not? Because you will you won't get your clothes dirty. And then she would say, no, you won't. No, they would say, no, you won't. She would say, yes, you will. Then you would say, no, we won't. And she would say, yes, you will. And you just keep doing this. You'll find, you don't know how many times you go through that sequence, and finally they just sneak off or she gives you permission. And then there comes a time when she starts to call you home. And when she says, children, and then the kids would say, I can't hear you. 
Why are you answering if you can't hear? <laughs> but they're saying they can't hear. And we know what that's like, because we know when mom was calling or dad was calling, and we didn't want to leave us. That was us. <laughs> I was actually trying to get you to come on. But you was there, so no hearts, just a little, they ain't angry yet. Wait till she, anyway. So when the kids wouldn't come, uh, then she would say, uh, okay, I'm going to send my bird after you. And then they would say, I can't hear you. And then she would say, all right, I'll send my uh, cat after you. And then she, the kids would say, we can't hear you. And then finally she would say, I will send my dog after you. And the kids would reply, we can't hear you. And then finally, she gets tired of sending folk. She said, I'll send myself after you. And when she said self, she broke out into a run, or he, or whoever it was. And these kids would just scatter everywhere. And she would run and chase and catch them and bring them into a place of punishment. Now, those were the games. Say, so these were the games. Say, so these are the games we used to play. Mm-hmm. All right. As children, we had a lot of fun playing these games. But there's a scripture found in 1 Corinthians 13, chapter 11, verse, and it says, When I was a child, I spoke as a child, I thought and I reasoned as a child. But when I became an adult, or when I grew up, when I became a man, I put away childish things. So the question today is, have you? Or are you still playing games with God? All right, let's take these very same games we just discussed and see how we are faring as adults, all right? One thing we need to ask ourselves in hide and seek, and this is, do we have secret dens and hiding places where we go to do our unjust do because we think that God or no one else can see you? And it's a what? It's a daily practice or a weekly practice or I've worked hard all week and I, I need to relax. And you find yourself in these places where as a child of God, he has what instructed you to come out from that behavior. But we have justified it in our minds. And we still find ourselves, whether it's just, I just, this just relaxes me. Or it's just a sip of something to, you know, just to get you in that mellow mode. Now, you don't do this stuff in church. I wonder why. Well, some churches you can smoke, but you're not supposed to bring your alcohol or that other stuff that, that you're. So we go to where it's accepted. And you're not judged for doing it. No one will walk up to you and say, you know, that cigarette will kill you. The devil designed it to take your life. <laughs> And he designed it so that you would become addicted to it. So even when you want to put it down, you can't. Because the craving keeps calling you back. And you keep just puff, you're puffing away your life one stick at a time. <laughs> and then God intervenes and he says, I'm trying to call you out of that. I didn't create your body for that. That's the temple of the Holy Ghost. Come, come. And then we say, I can't hear you. Praise God. Okay. Let's, uh, Ephesians 5 and 11, what does it say? And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. So if you're there, are you fulfilling your purpose? Or are you just encouraging the madness that's going on around you? You walk in and you're supposed to be a light. But all you're doing is contributing to the darkness. Amen. What do they say? Birds of a feather do what? They flock together. All right. So let's go on to one, two, three, red light. Are you still playing this game? We pretend to be saintly when everybody is watching. And as soon as the pastor's back is turned, as soon as the church mother is off the property, all this other behavior, and every once in a while they look back, and then you pretend to be saved. You come to church and you put on your holy uh, regalia. You, do, you, you know how to get with the music and move and to dance and you know how to appear to be. How are you today? Blessed and highly favored. 
You know what to say. You go through all of these games, praise God. And as soon as those who would bring correction into your life are not looking, because that's when you turn around, they're busy doing something else, you're doing all this crazy stuff behind their backs. But, you know, the sad thing about one, two, three red light is that the one that you are trying to fool isn't the one keeping tabs on you. But God is. And so you're really not fooling anybody but yourself. See how the enemy works? He has a way to deceive us to make us think that we're getting by. I have a stellar reputation among men. And then God will say, but who are you? You're a worker of iniquity. No, no one could see or no one ever saw you do anything. No one but God. And that's the one who's keep, keeping record. So 1 Corinthians, the fourth chapter and the fifth verse, what does it say? Therefore judge nothing before the time. Yes. Until the Lord comes, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness. Hold up right there. <sighs> There's a time God is going to bring to light everything you've done in the dark. The only way that thing cannot be brought up is for that thing to be under the blood. Amen. Because that thing will serve to convict you. That's evidence against you. Evidence that you did not receive the blood because if you had, it's covered. But when you don't, God notices it every single time. So all of this is, and you know how you, you in a courtroom situation and they bring in all these witnesses? Those who saw you do what you did. God's his own witness. So he says, uh, everything will be brought to light, hidden things of darkness, and will make manifest the counsels of the heart, even the things that you hide in here. God says, yeah, you never cussed nobody out, but boy, you were a pro under your breath. You see people come, you're smiling, and you, I can't stand that guts. See, saints, we have to understand that God is in charge of all of this. It's not just how we look or how people perceive. We should be reflecting what's real and what's on the inside of us. So our hearts, our minds should be pure, and our thoughts should be pure. And if we have difficulty, those are the things we take to the Father because we don't want that kind of stuff to continue. Amen? That's one, two, three, red light. All right? Are you still a uh, blind man's bluff, bluff? Are you still fooling and fumbling in the dark? Are you not aware of the dangers that are out there? You, if you go home, we turn out all the lights in here right now. It would be difficult for most of you to get out of here without what... Uh, hitting a knee, busting your shin, or doing something because you can't navigate in the dark. Jesus brings light into our lives. And what I love about the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit brings, comes with a spirit of conviction and a spirit of revelation. He lets you know when you are outside of the will of God and you're not comfortable in that place. If you are comfortable, I guarantee you have not made a decision to live for God. I was telling Kitty and some others, I said, because, you know, we oftentimes we're trying to encourage people to, to receive Christ. But, you know, you can't make people love God. You could be af afraid for them and all of that, and they just won't listen. They won't see. They won't do whatever. But, you know, until they want it for themselves, the best we can do is to keep them covered in prayer. God, I know they're hard-headed, and they can't see it. The devil, although the spirit of this world has them blinded, Look, whatever it takes, don't allow them to have to spend eternity in hell. So in 2 Corinthians 4, chapter 3rd to 4th verse, it says, But if our gospel is hid, it's hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of this glorious gospel of Christ, who is in the image of God, should shine upon them. So if you can't hear what God is saying, or if you don't want to receive it, that's letting you know that some, the, the spirit of blindness, the devil will often turn you and push you in another direction so you won't see or hear what God has for you. 
You wonder why you fall asleep when you start reading your Bible? I guarantee you, you, you could be tired, but I also guarantee that the enemy don't want you to pick up anything. Why you fall asleep in church? Why we have to keep things kind of restricted to a time frame? Because people ain't going to give you but so much time. And after that, their attention goes to whatever it is the world is offering. The things they rather do. They just hear out of tradition. Or to keep mama happy. Or because daddy made me come. And then we find ourselves, what, distracted. Even when the word of God is coming forth. Distracted in service. And this is what we should be feeding on what God is offering. Praise God. Hallelujah. So that, that, that spirit of blindness is out there. I know it's real because I was blinded once. And I remember the day when the Holy Spirit pierced the blindness, the darkness. And it was like lights came on. And when you could see what you couldn't see before. God, I didn't know. But now I know. Now I see. Now you want more of what it is that you've gotten a taste of. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Then we come down, praise God, to playing this game with Grandma Gray. We have been asked as God's children to sanctify ourselves. And it's just something, I'm gonna, uh, something I want to do next Sunday because we haven't preached in that vein for some time. But I just felt led that we need to do it. Sometimes when uh, we're so inundated with what the world is offering and where the world has gone and how it's trying to encourage you to go with it, that we get to the place where we, it's a spirit of compromise that we adapt or adopt into our existence. And then we don't really, really pay that much attention to it, but we're looking more and more like them. And they're looking less and less like us. They're provoking us to do what they want to do, and we're not provoking them to holiness. It's because we become lax. And we really prefer that to this. And we want what they got. Whatever styles come out, we want to be seen wearing that. We want that reputation. But that's, that's a particular uh, uh, design that holiness possesses. And I hate to say this, but people, holiness isn't popular. Because it seems too rigid. It only seems rigid to those who haven't yielded. Because once you yield to the truth... You know this is the best thing going. And everybody I know that's saved, the, the one thing that they wish is that they had gotten saved sooner. Because when they finally found out, man, why didn't somebody convince me? Well, somebody was trying, you just weren't listening. Praise God, you could save yourself so much. Don't mean that you won't have a, a burden-free life just because you're saved. Well, would you rather go through the stuff life has to offer without God or with God? Amen. Praise God. So you got somebody who will take you through. Amen? So when we get to Grandma Gray, uh, this 2 Corinthians, the 6th chapter and the 17th verse, it says, Therefore, come out from among these unbelievers and separate yourselves from them, says the Lord. Then he says, don't touch their filthy things, and I will welcome you. We have to take scriptures like this. I don't care what version you read it in. It's telling you that you are, if you're a saint or a Christian or born-again believer, you are of an exclusive nature. You totally contradict what the world is doing. We see something other than. So this is why on yesterday uh, in that, that service and someone is celebrating 30 years of commitment. When I was growing up, it wasn't so strange. But you look at TV now, we celebrate, and we wonder why we get to the place that we, we've come to. We celebrate pregnancy out of wedlock, especially if it's a celebrity. They are not held to the same standard everybody else is, ha is held to. And, you know, they can have five, six, seven intimate boyfriends or girlfriends, and, and fornication is no longer a sin to the world, but it is to God. And so we accept this here, and you don't realize when you let the cat in, he didn't come in just as a cat, he came in with fleas. You got all kinds of stuff. And so now you're disgusted, oh, how could we have come to this place? And how could we have come so far? It's because you 
compromised. One thing, and all of this other came in with it. Saints, we have to wake up. We have to understand that God is calling us to a standard because compromise doesn't win people to Christ. They have to see the difference and they have to desire. They need, uh, 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 they should want what you have to offer. So when people stand in there, and I know how often Elder Barry prays for his children, prays for us and things like that. If you could have heard what his son said at that podium yesterday, as educated and as smart as he is and all the money he's making, he said, I realize something. I need what my parents have. You get into these Ivy League schools, these are old demons. And they just don't give an argument. They, they can support it with 1,200 different sources. And you go there, and you got one about Bible verse. And they'll have you, what, compromise? And say, you got to know who you are and whose you are. And, but let me tell you the trick. You don't need to know the Bible verbatim. What you need to know is the unction of the Holy Spirit. Because when you got the unction of the Spirit... I can't argue with you, sir, but something in me tells me that is not the truth. And then you go home and you pull off your box. God, show me. Every single time, he'll bring it to you in the word of God. Now you got a leg to stand on. Yeah, you you do a lot of little things and maneuver your way through all their requirements and stuff like that. But college should not cost you your salvation. Praise God. Woo, glory. Hallelujah, hallelujah. So we, we come to things like this. Uh, and it says, uh, so God says, I, you have uh, uh, erred and, and you're dirty and you've, you've gotten, you know, you've walked out from my protective cover and I'm calling you. I'm calling you to the point that I've sent my prophets after you. And you say, I can't hear you. How many sermons have you listened to? Prophetic words have you received, and your life still hasn't changed any better for God. So we don't listen to the prophets. Then he says, all right, then I, I will send my evangelist after you. And what an evangelist, he'll go where you are. You can find one on your job. It's somebody on your job preaching the gospel. You can be sitting at, I was sitting at a bar getting ready to take a drink, and the man sitting next to me said, you shouldn't be doing that. I said, And he wasn't saved and telling me what I shouldn't be doing. He said, he said you don't belong in here. I was dumbfounded, Rachel. But somebody was praying for Horace long before Horace knew anybody was even praying for him. So somebody was looking. At you. Be, there are indications like that all around us. But we'll say, ah, man, leave me alone. Mind your own business. Do your own thing, right? You need to be able to identify the ways God sends someone into your life to give you a word and time. It could be even a child. Briley was on the beach uh, last week, and I think they said they saw a cross on a sun, uh, a sand dune, right? And he, he asked, uh, I don't want to get this wrong. What did he say? He said, I guess God died in Pensacola, Florida. Because he saw a cross. <laughs> Why would he even make that reference? He has to hear the right thing. So that he could, you know, so you start them off as children in teachings of the faith. No, that wasn't his tombstone. But he knows the cross means that, what, that's the place where Jesus died on a cross. Oh, praise God. I thought it was cute anyway. Praise God. So he sends his evangelists, he sends his pastors, and you say, I can't hear you. He sends his anointed messengers, empowered with the word of God, authority, and the Holy Spirit, and yet we refuse to call. But as in the game, there's coming a time, and the time is sooner than you think, that God is not going to send anyone else. Because whether you believe it or not, he says, let patience have his perfect work. There's a time when his patience will become perfect. And that's the exclusion. Mercy and grace will be completed. 
And after, immediately after that, he has to come with some form of judgment. So he said, I'll send myself after you. And when he comes, you don't want to be caught in the condition you're in if you're outside of Jesus Christ. Because he tells you, it's too late at that moment. If you go to Revelations, he'll tell you, whatever. if you're unjust, just continue to be. Because you had ample opportunity. And I know you heard the message because you replied. Even today in settings like this, you know, it's going, oh, I don't even listen to that. I don't want to be, I don't want all of that. He, he's keeping record. He can show you on July 1st, 2018, at 12.05, you're sitting in Born Again Church, and I sent a direct message to you. God ain't stupid. You can stand and argue your case all you want to. He says, I got it right here. That ain't good enough for you. I got it on video. He can bring up service and then zoom in right on you and say, see what's going on in your head right there? He says, I was doing my best and you were pushing back tomorrow, not today, not me. So he says, let the unjust remain unjust. The filthy, just continue on being filthy. He says, let the righteous be righteous and let, and let the holy be holy. Because he says, I'm coming quickly. Now, that's the operative word to me, quickly. You think the bat of an eye is quick. You think light travels at a, a rapid speed. But God, if he says he's coming, I don't even know what his quick is. But that tells me I don't need to try to change when he's coming. Because when he decides to come, he's here. It's not like I'm on my way and you're 11 hours away. And you know if you drive, it is going to take 11 hours to get from Orlando to Nashville or whatever. He, so when he says, I'm coming, I'm here. You won't have time to do anything but be what you are. Look at all the time you got right now. You have now to make a decision for Christ. And he says he's bringing his what? His reward with him. He won't have to go back and say, oh, you, oh, I didn't know you got saved. Let me go back and get this. No, he's coming with everything that he needs. So people, if you turn to your neighbor, I want you to say this to them. Say, neighbor, don't pretend, don't pretend. You, don't hear you don't hear the voice of God, voice of God. Calling, you. calling you. Come on, give God a hand, praise. I'm going, to, I'm going to end with this in 2 Timothy, the fourth chapter, the first through the fourth verse. It says, I charge thee therefore by God. And this is Paul talking to Timothy. Timothy. And the Lord Jesus Christ, he says, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom? He says, do what? Preach the word. He says, be instant, in season, out of season. He says, to reprove and to rebuke, to exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come. Let me tell you, the time is here. Because when that was written, that was thousands of years ago. The time is here when people will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they do what? Heap to themselves teachers who would tell me what I prefer to hear as opposed to what I need to hear. And he says, and they will turn their ears from the truth and they will be turned unto childhood gains, fables, fairy tales, anything that pleases you in the moment. And the truth has been made available. Amen? Turn to your neighbor and says, neighbor, you know God is calling you. Don't, st don't sit here and act like you don't hear him. So if you're not saved... There's a calling of salvation. And God is saying, come. I can walk you through the process because you will feel the, the spirit of conviction on your heart. Oh, man. Of all the Sundays I had to come, they use this throwback thing to 
get me over here today. Now, God used this throwback thing to get you over here today. But you still got to contend with what's going on in your spirit. If you are saved, but you know you have slacked, or you've been, you, you're in a seat of, uh, of ease, you know, Scripture talks about Zion being at ease in Zion. And you, you, you can list your, your places of compromise. And you know you need to recommit to Christ. You need to make a, a decision to do what you know God is requiring of you. Some things you need to push away. Some things you pushed away and you brought them back into your life. You've justified them. You got a whole support system. You got people who will praise you in it, but you still know it's wrong. I'm trying to erase the delusion. God is calling you to holiness. He's calling you to righteousness. And he's saying, come, just allow him to do what he does. He will purify, he will perfect your life. Won't you come, praise God.